Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this talk, uh, Modeling Fighters and Drones Using System Modeler. My name is Jan Brugård. I'm the CEO of Wolfram MathCore, developers of System Modeler. And in this talk, uh, to our interns, Atefe Esmailisset, Ismail Sadeh and Eric Espinosa uh, will uh, present uh, on a topic related to the new release of the aircraft library. So uh, let me hand over to Atefe. Thanks. Well, with the recent development of the aerospace technology, now we know that the gravity doesn't quite hold us down where the sky is not the limit, but merely a starting point and where the technology meets the adventure in the most accelerating way. Among aerospace vehicles, quadrotors are now uh, widely used in many different areas and have found their place in various industries and applications, even beyond Earth for space purposes. They came a long way starting from 1922 with the but is it a helicopter with the huge rotor blades of around five meter to the current nanoquadrators. But what is behind this widespread use? I'm Atef Ismailzadeh, a control system intern at Wolfram Mascor. Today, I invite you to join me on a quick overview of the quadrotors through the aircraft library of the uh, Wolfram system modeler. Let's start with the quadrotor dynamics. The ingenious part of the quadrature design is the arrangement of the propellers to control the drone in six degrees of freedom, although it just has four actuators uh, that are actually forces coming from the rotation of the propellers. As you can see in this slide, you have different colors for the propellers in the diagonal that shows the different rotation speed, uh, spin. So, here you can see that the yellow ones rotating uh, counterclockwise and the green one uh, rotating clockwise. Uh, this arrangement benefits from canceling out the net moment generated by rotors and prevent quad rotor to spin. Furthermore, it allows the coupling of the angular motion. Following the rotation arrangement, a positive roll motion, as you can see here, and the same amount of the decrement of the rotation speed of the other two propellers. And uh, uh, a positive pitch results from the generating a positive lift increment, which is the result of a faster rotation speed and uh, negative uh, of the front propellers and the negative one for the back propellers. And uh, finally, your motion comes from the faster rotation in one diagonal pair and a slower rotation of the other diagonal pair. These changes in the rotation speeds are commanded by the control system to quadrature. Now I think that you can guess the reason behind the popularity of the quadrotors. Well, the dynamics seems relatively simple. However, the challenge lies in the controller design and how to make the quadrotor more stable, precise, efficient, and less human interactive. Wolfram System Modeler gives you the opportunity to test and create your own quadrature. And let's begin with an example in uh, System Modeler. This example integrates the quadrature body, as you can see here, connected to a controller. And you have the reference uh, inputs, which are the X, Y, Z positions, and yaw angle that is uh, commanded to the controller. Uh, we can run this simulation, and also you have the possibility to select the reference trajectory type, which uh, we uh, go with the infinity trajectory. And let's see the result. This video shows the front view and top view of the infinity motion of the quadrature. The pink sphere shows the reference trajectory, and we added a one uh, second lag, so you can see how the quadrotor tries to catch the reference trajectory. All right. If 
you remember, I mentioned that the challenge lies in the control system design. In the next example that we see, uh, we compare two different control structure for the same quad rotor and same input. So you can see here in quad rotor number two, we connected to uh, uh, we connected it to a controller in which we fed back the angles and positions. While for the quad rotor number one, uh, we also fed back the angular rates and velocities in addition to the position and the angles. So a spoiler alert. Just remember the fast and a slow quadrator. And now let's see uh, the difference in the results. Here you can see uh, the plot of the exposition versus time. So here you can see the reference, uh, which is uh, shown by the green line. And the fast one uh, tried to react to the uh, change faster and tries to follow the path closer to the reference trajectory. That's because it has more information of the quadrature, which we fed back the velocities and ang uh, angular rates. While the other one uh, responds slower, uh, but it's uh, more smooth and uh, uh, it's with less os oscillation. So depending on the application, it's a trade-off to select uh, which type of the controller. For example, for the photography, you may need something uh, to uh, follow the path smoother and slower, while for the search and rescue, you may need a high performance fast quadratures. And the uh, multi rotor package is not limited to the quadratures. Uh, you can you have all the tools to uh, model multi rotor vehicles. This is an example of the 76 uh, rotor vehicle, which has been implemented using the multi rotor package of the uh, uh, system modeler uh, for a customer from aerial industry companies. Uh, for uh, the animation, we use simple objects. Here you can see the uh, spheres uh, and the uh, cylinders. Uh, so it's uh, it's been used for the initial stage uh, of the design of the vehicle. That's why we have them uh, in a, a simple object. And the cylinders on the propeller are presented here for the color coding of the propellers for the efficient uh, and uh, smart control mechanism. So let's see the motion of this vehicle. Here you can see the takeoff, spin, and lateral and forward motion. With this, I conclude the drone part. Uh, thank you for your attention. Now I'd like to open the floor for my colleague. Feel free to hold on your curiosity, write down your question, and I'll be more than delighted to address them uh, during our upcoming uh, question and answer session. Thanks. Thank you very much, Atefe. And um, okay. Good morning, dear passengers. This is your captain speaking. We ask you to please fasten your seat belts and secure all baggage underneath your seat as we approach supersonic speeds. My name is Eric Espinosa, systems engineer intern at Wolfram MathCore and we'll be presenting the modeling of supersonic aircraft. Even if the term supersonic reminds us of modernity, technology, and achievement, it's been with us since long time ago. The flash before the thunder or the characteristic hupa sound from the leash, they've been present here forever. Nevertheless, millennia of development would have been needed in order for the Concorde to take off and cruise at Mach 2.2 and break the sound barrier. Now, the term sound barrier does not come for free. Even during World War II, trained engineers and physicians believed that large objects such as an airplane would not be able to break the speed of sound. The reason for this is drag. Drag is the force that opposes movement in the air, and it's the one that as a kid we experience when we get our hand out on a moving car. The airplane experiences the same, and it again opposes 
its movement. And they had reasons to believe so. If we can see both the predictions, mathematical predictions and the experimental data seem to show that there was an asymptote, that it went to infinity on Mach 1.0, as we can see in this graph. On the X axis, we have the Mach, and on the Y axis, we have the parasite drag, which measures this drag force in a way. It went to infinity, so they had the reasons to believe so. Nevertheless, they were wrong. And on October 14, 1947, Captain Charles Chuck Yeager broke the speed of sound on board his Bell X-1 in this beautiful orange color. And you can see how it's actually shaped like a bullet because engineers back then knew that the bullet was stable at supersonic speeds. But before we continue, we should speak a bit what is Mach, just this technicality. Mach is not really the velocity of the airplane by itself, but rather a ratio between this velocity of the airplane and the local acoustic speed, which is actually temperature dependent, so it changes. And what's very special about it, that if the airplane starts to travel faster than the speed of sound, the sound waves, as we can see on the image, will start to stack on front of it, eventually generating a shock wave here on red. Now, what is really complex about the modeling supersonic and especially transonic? Well, like everything that involves fluids, they are capricious. So you have apparition and disappearances of shock waves almost randomly and chaotically along the aircraft wing because they depend on the local velocity. Therefore, it's very, very complex to model, even for the most powerful computational fluid dynamics softwares. So how are we going to do that with Sifton Modeler? Well, thankfully, we have some experimental information from the US Air Force and the NASA, especially from some aircraft from the 50s and the 60s. And also, this work is based on uh, some uh, work from Professor Peter Cruz from Lin Shopping University, where I study. We can see on this graph that, again, on the x-axis, we have the Mach number. And on the y-axis, again, the parasite drag. We can see how it behaves for different aircraft. And in this way, from the subsonic, before achieving the speed of sound, it's quite low. When it's transonic, we see the steep change, which is the one that used to confuse engineers. Nevertheless, it reaches a peak, and then it becomes supersonic, and it goes back down a little bit more. Now. How can we actually do that with uh, this implementation with the World Drum language? It's pretty easy, especially because of the sliders. Once that we introduce a modified version of Peter Cruz's equation, then we can actually use the sliders to tune it so that they look exactly or very close to as the experimental data that we want to achieve without actually having to get into the core mathematics of what these shaping variables represent. Super easy to do super effective. We can even go one step further and consider for the wing sweep. The wing sweep is this angle that forms between the wing and um, the lateral plane. Basically, how much the airplane looks like an arrow. For example, if we check at zero degrees, which is like this Bell X-ray one, the one that Chuck Yeager used to um, break the speed of sound, the change in drag, again, Mach versus drag, is really steep. Nevertheless, if we give some angle to it, let's say 20 degrees, we have a lot less of an increase. If we go to 45 degrees, like in the case for this Thunder Chief, eh, it doesn't get that much better, but it's still a, long a, long, a longer decrease of drag than with zero degrees. If we go full delta, like this delta dagger, 60 degrees, then we can see that the increases of drag is so much lower. That is why the airliner in which you travel has some sweep, not because it's going to cross the speed of sound like the Concorde, but because it's actually flying really close to it, about Mach 0 0.7. It's because of this. Now, the same methodology was followed for uh, the other variables that are changing. Let's say the slope of the lift against the angle of attack. 
like in this graph over here. From there, we can actually generate a nice 3D graph, which relates the lift coefficient with the Mach and with the angle of attack. These kind of graphs give a huge insight, not only to students or developers, but also to engineers. And they are not that easy to be found on a textbook, at least the ones that I've seen so far. So how do we actually uh, make the simulation of this first supersonic flight? It looks rather simple. We have the, X, the airplane in the center, and we're going to control constant control. We're going to connect constant control inputs to this airplane. So no pilot on board. Probably Chuck Yeager is going to have a rather bumpy ride today. Now, if we check inside of this aircraft, we're going to see its main components, named propulsion, body, and its control surfaces. How is the drag uh, modeled? Using a simple world force. Here, it has the input that have all the mathematical modeling that comes from the modifications from Peter Cruz's work. And as you see after that, we have modeled the supersonic aircraft. Now, the only thing left to do, the link between Mathematica and System Modeler, is that we get these parameters that we got from tuning the curves, and we introduce them as parameters for the simulation. And with that, dear passengers, we are ready to break the speed of sound. So buckle up as we see the results of this simulation. And if we check it over here, first let's see that it is behaving as we want it to, to behave. Again, on the x-axis, we have the Mach. And on the y-axis, we have the drag coefficient here, the wave drag, which is a supersonic drag. It does exactly what experiments say it does. There is a steep increase. Then it reaches a maximum, and then it starts to go down as the airplane is accelerating. Know that this is very counterintuitive. Here, the maximum is not reached at exactly Mach 1.0. This is because of some angle of attack variations. Now, if we take a look to the drag coefficients, the drag is made out of a lot of things. The parasite drag is the one that we feel when we put our hands outside. And the wave drag is the one that is being generated because of supersonic airspeed. So if you see the drag coefficient of the wave, it's actually the supersonic drag. We can see how at the beginning, it's the parasite drag, the one from the hand, that is the main contributor to the total drag. Nevertheless, as the airplane is approaching speed of sound, we can see here plotted the Mach, it reaches a maximum. Nevertheless, as said before, as the airplane keeps accelerating, it goes down, even if the Mach goes up. Then, as the airplane starts to decelerate, it peaks again at Mach 1.0, and then as it reaches subsonic airspeeds, it goes way down. So moral of the story, don't fly at transonic airspeeds. You either fly subsonic, very fast but subsonic, which is the way that airliners do, or you cruise at supersonic airspeeds, which is what the Concorde did, which is what the fighter aircraft that cruise at uh, super cruise can do. And with this, we can actually check the simulation. And here we see the Bell X1 traveling. This is the time scale to 10 times more as, um, as it should do. And you can see that there's nothing really interesting happening to the naked eye. Well, because shock waves are invisible to the human eye. Also, we don't see the condensation uh, cone that we see on internet pictures. That's because the humidity at the altitude at which Chuck Yeager broke the speed of sound is not really a lot. What we can see is some oscillation. And this I would like to ask the question for the audience. Why is this oscillation happening? I give you a clue. It has to do that there is not a pilot present. And with that, dear passengers, we have reached our destination of supersonic flight and drone modeling. We open the floor for questions, and we invite you to come to the Wolfram System Modeler uh, digital booth. Thank you. I, ho I hope people enjoyed it. And, uh, and this is uh, the work done with the aircraft uh, Point O library, uh, which will be released with uh, system modeler with the next release of system modeler. We have a we have a question, Jan. Sorry, um, yeah. from from Randy Junk. Uh, do you have uh, any handouts? Yes, it will be uploaded um, soon after the the conference. Thanks. Right.
Yeah, we will. Uh, yeah, as soon as possible. As soon as they will, they will be available soon for you. Um, awesome. Then uh, I think uh, that's it. It was a, a quick flight. Hope, hope you enjoyed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.